but I do always associate you with the term counting things is hard. I, yes. <laughs> I don't know why I do, I say that a fair amount. But can you say, but I think it's true. So even from my, I was, I think about this a lot lately in animation because I've been working in Maya and I find myself counting keyframes all the time. I'll be like, okay, I'm on frame 48 and I know that I want to add six frames. And then my brain will be like, what's, you know, six plus 48. And I'm like, oh my, you know, it, I get stuck, but like, I'm constantly counting frames. So mm -hmm. I'm constantly reminding myself that counting is hard. Um, but what are some things that you've discovered that make counting hard? Oh God, that's probably the thing is that I always I always say that because I always wind up saying, people ask me what I do and I always joke that I just count things for a living. <laughs> like that has been my, the one constant in my career for like 15 plus years now. It's just <laughs> counting, finding the right thing to count, right? If you can okay. figure out the right thing to count, you don't need the fancy stats. You don't need a lot of fancy anything. You just, if you can magically just reach into people's heads and count the right thing, right? Okay. Like for example, you know, how many people happen to love this obscure sandwich? I don't know, I'm just making something up here. Well, like no one's yet, you know, think about how you would do that in the real world, like surveys and interview mm -hmm. and sampling and all this complex stuff. But if you had a magic wand, you could just reach into every person's brain and just ask them, you know, do you like this sandwich? And you just got the truthful answer out of them, right? Like. You wouldn't need any of that fancy stuff. You literally just count everyone, get the percent and be done, right? And so obviously you can't do that. No one has that power. So that's why, but like if you could, right? So that's why counting is hard, right? Like most of my job is just figuring out how to slice things enough so that I can use my limited ability to use statistics and data science and whatever to get at the answer, right? And like I've just spent my life cheating <laughs> doing that. It's cheating. I feel like this is coming up and now I'm going to, I am not even going to try to attribute this to someone because maybe it's you, but maybe it's someone else. Um, where like the core of data science is counting things, um, where, where, where it really is counting things. So what kind of things do you count in your work or have you counted in previous jobs? A lot of times it's just people with certain attributes, right? Like very common theme in data science, right? Like people who want to give you money. Every business person wants that number. Obviously, very complicated in how you define that, right? Or people happy with a certain feature. People, back when I, my first job was at an interior design company and they hired me as like a consultant. Very strange, it was like a small consultancy in New York City. They did, they did space planning for like banks and they did the, they literally did, wrote the Google master plan as in, if you build a Google building, here are all the rules for like where, like maximum number of feet you could be from a micro kitchen. Like they wrote that book. And I just like joined randomly as a consultant helping them. They were like, we need a data person. Somehow I convinced them that they could, they should hire me. I don't know how, <laughs> right. And I was just doing survey work, analyzing data, automating things in Python for them. And it was just like, it was just figuring out like how many, like looking at surveys, rows and rows of students at a university and you start seeing interesting patterns about like students were piling books up next to them in the stacks to get privacy, to get at the table. They were studying, this was like some large Ivy League college okay. and they just were stacking books. And like, and you can just like eventually just tease out the fact that like a lot of these students just needed quiet places to study and they weren't getting it. And so they were just figuring it out. And so I was just helping them like quantify that. It's like, well, you see a lot of these, a surprising number for the amount of responses that we're getting, right? And this has to lead to something. And of course, it got, that goes into how they designed the library and where or should they, you know, put more desks or more silent space work or more meeting rooms. And so that's where I got my start. Then I got thrown into ads, which is counting interesting, <laughs> sketchy things, fraud, because <laughs> I was at like a third tier tech, third tier like ad place. So, I got to see all sorts of fraud get sent around, made all sorts of shenanigans going on in that industry when you dig scratch the surface of it. Yeah. And uh, and then went to Meetup and we were counting, you know, actual users doing not fraud, <laughs> which is a change, right? And just like, did they like doing this? Did they like going to events, right? Mm -hmm. Like that kind of interesting stuff and helping product work. So that's just what I've been doing, just counting very interesting things. Yeah, I mean, but it but it is interesting. And so what like what prepared you for this career in counting things? Like how did how did you become a career counter? <laughs> I don't know. As in look, my background, my undergrad was I did um 
couple of degrees. I had a philosophy. So okay. continental philosophy, you know, not, not like the American, if you go to, uh, there's two branches of philosophy in, in the, okay. in the big grand scheme of things, right? It, in America, you usually do a philosophy degree. It's like the majority of it. I don't know to present anymore is what they call like, um, it's essentially logic, right? It's like, you know, logic and the logicians of, you know, like Bertrand Russell and all that stuff about, you know, um, uh, their counts, uh, things. <laughs> whereas, whereas I did continental, which is the European tradition. You read the great philosophers of, and then critique them and understand them. So, you know, it was like mm -hmm. Kant and, uh, and Aristotle was in there, Hume, all sorts of stuff, right? Okay. And so somehow I went there, but then on top of that, I had a business undergrad, don't even know why, <laughs> <laughs> but I wound up doing operations research there. So that was like okay. networks and like, um, and decision support systems and, and, and just like, and some basic accounting and all, all of this stuff is like totally unrelated, but it became, comes useful later on when I'm like working with everyone in a company and suddenly, Hey, I know accounting. I can talk to the finance department. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know marketing. I can talk to those guys and understand what they're up to. Right. And then the operations guys were useful when I was in e-commerce and they were making kids clothes. And we were actually had shipments going around the globe for like cloth and dyes and factories and suddenly that became useful right so yeah. I just stumbled upon things then I go get a master's in communications human communication social science totally unrelated I wanted to go to information science the yeah. the chair for was a chair of both departments I couldn't get into info side because it was a small program but they're like hey if you you know want you can go over here and do calm and I'm like all right fine I'll do calm so <laughs> makes no sense but it but it kind of does because it does help you right like this has got a these are an intersection of really interesting I mean, things it, it helped i totally yeah. like social science was a or i should say a lot of really good data scientists come out of social science mm -hmm. programs Pol political science neuroscience those people they um the, the thing about social science that i kind of joke joke about is that they're they've got a complex literally about being a science Right. They're like, you know, if we're measuring stuff in people's heads, to mm -hmm. what extent is that a real thing or some fake thing that we made up? Right. That is a thing that they are very concerned about and think a lot about. Mm -hmm. And so they have a lot of rigor and philosophy of science classes out as a as a first year graduate student to just kind of drill into your head that, yes, we are an actual freaking science. <laughs> we measure stuff, scientific method, you know. Yeah. And we're not just making theories up like, uh, you know, the philosophies of uh, philosophers of old, right? And mm -hmm. that kind of self-doubt, that whole awareness that you are measuring something that may or may not even be real. And here's ways to like, that we're dealing with that is really useful in data science. Yeah, that's, that's such an interesting point. So I don't ever talk about this, but um, I didn't finish my PhD, but my PhD was in immunology and infectious diseases. Uh, but it was particularly focused on prion diseases of the neurosystem. So I did a bunch of neuroscience and it, it really, it was so much of school. Like you're reminding me, I took, um, I took a philosophy of science class, right? We read objectivity and I remember reading this book and it was like, what is the more accurate picture of a flower? Is it an exact drawing of the flower you see, or is it a representation of all flowers of like the same species? And I was like, well, now I don't know what to believe. <laughs> Welcome to epistemology. Yay. <laughs> yeah, yep. like, but yeah, and, and, you know, I mean, even my dissertation project, um, I was picking up a small grant that someone in the lab before me had done and they had gotten positive results. And I did this experiment for 18 months over and over and over again. It took like three to four weeks to run and I kept getting negative results. And my PI was like, your funding depends on positive results. And I was like, but I'm not, it, it, they're negative. Like they're negative. I can't, I don't know what to tell you. And he was like, well, maybe you don't know how to do a Western blot. And like, he would make people sit with me to do a Western blot. And they would be like, she's, she's doing it right. And um, yeah, it was really, it was, it, it was kind of that idea of like, we got positive results, but then I couldn't replicate. And so then you get into reproducibility, mm -hmm. right? So if you measure something and then you can't repeat that measurement, like where is the, where is the validity? Yeah. Yep. 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 So all of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And data science, we don't even do 
the validity studies. <laughs> some data scientists do. Yeah, some have the time to do it, right? Like, yeah, it's mostly yeah. that. Yeah, that's true. So, okay, so you've got these two undergrad degrees. You've got a master's degree. Are there more degrees in there? Luckily, no. Like after <laughs> two years, I like got. I was like, you know what? Research fun. Publishing not fun, and I just bailed out of there, and I just yeah. went straight into industry, which worked out. So where did you, so you've worked, you, you know, I think your title now is a quantitative UX researcher, but you are in the data science world. Where did you pick up programming? Uh, so I started my first programming. Well, high school, we like had a joke programming class where we learned C or C++, but back then, and this was like the very late nineties, it was C++ was weird. Back then it was essentially C with classes and Hmm. That was, they taught it as C with classes. They, like C++ didn't become like the standard library and all that fancy jazz until a little bit later. So I like didn't, wasn't on that. So it was just C, but you could do templates in classes. It was very weird. So I learned that, didn't know what to do with it, but it's like, all right, cool. And then I like learned at, in my decision support class in, in college, I learned VBA <laughs> in okay. Excel yes. and did a lot of horrible things with it, which is really funny. I also learned Python at some point. I don't even know where. Yeah. Right? So I was a bit of a nerd back then already, like playing with Linux and stuff. But anyways, so learn VBA. And then for a research project undergrad, my professor was like, hey, I need you to do this network routing thing and just implement it. And I was like, well, I, I know VBA. I don't have time to do this. I'm going to build a freaking linked list in VBA with cell, literally just having linked lists in columns in Excel. And then the cell is just moving things around because I didn't have time to do it the hard way. I knew the algorithm, I just didn't have time yeah. to the yeah. language word. So I did it that way. It worked, it was terrifying. <laughs> you can do, I mean, unholy things with Excel. It is, yep. it is horrifying and incredible and beautiful all in one. Yeah, and then I like, you know, in my first job, I took that even further and I used Python to automate okay. Excel to make thousands of slides in PowerPoint, save, thousands of dollars in like in in um in uh consultant time because i was just mass generating these templated uh presentations out it was yeah terrifying and amazing all at once <laughs> yeah i think like the true power of python is is really kind of incredible the things that you can i mean many programming languages have that but yeah with python you can you can do a lot like a lot with python yep. it, enough to be horribly dangerous and it was just like <laughs> yeah this is throwaway code anyway so it's okay but now I have fun stories Fine. <laughs> yeah I mean that's that's like half of it right like I think that was something when I first started out in data science I got really hung up on doing things the right way instead of just getting them done right and so just wanting like oh if everybody's using this database and this you know programming language like how do I do it like like the pros instead of just delivering value so I would have had more fun stories I think if I had just focused on delivering value <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, fun, like, hey, guess, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk a lot, well, you mentioned in your bio, I should say, about um, that you stress about data quality. Mm -hmm. uh, so why is data quality, like, why is data quality important? Why should anyone care about data quality? Uh, it, go, it goes back to the counting is hard thing. Okay. Because like, if you don't know what has been counted, or specifically, if you don't know what has not been counted, you can do, okay. it gets extremely dangerous, right? About what you're actually able to say about this data, right? Like, you know, yeah. imagine you were doing neuroscience things and you're like, yes, I've counted every instance of someone having this disease and you just did not count the rest of the population that did not have a disease, right? You get, the, the, the stats get all wonky when you do it that way, right? Yeah. And so um, knowing that, and, just, and then this is true for any data set, like a lot of data science, the, the boot camps and all that, right? They're like, here is data set, just go with it. I'm like, what? Yeah, but yeah, but like, where did this data come from? Who made this? Data? Like, there's all these horrible questions that when you start scratching on the surface of, there's no end to it. And you have like, so you have to balance the, well, am I willing to like engage with this data set and the quality of it? And you like really understand what's going on. And that's going to take me, you know, weeks mm -hmm. for some big data sets like the census. It'll take you in your entire career to like yeah. get it, right? Yeah. And I have to deliver something. <laughs> so, I worry about that a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Because I was thinking, so earlier I had talked with Allison Horst and Allison Hill about the Palmer Penguins data set. 
and what they liked about it. And part of it, so it was someone's dissertation research. It is a complete data set. And, um, you know, you know how it was collected. They talked to the researcher and it, you know, there were some missing values, but they knew like you could get the ins and outs of this entire data set, which I think does make it really nice. But even now that you mentioned the census, you're right. Like that's an entire career. Um, and sometimes we hand, you know, intro to data science students census data and say, have fun, right? Without any kind of guidelines mm -hmm. on what they should or shouldn't be doing. Oh, yeah. The census one is especially dangerous because like if you ever listen, like, because I don't know the census data very well, but I if I pay attention when people start talking about it, like the researchers who talk about it, and they're like citing like, yeah, the ACS is done every X, Y, Z years, and they're, and this is the how it's done, and and then the sampling change on this year, like, they know their stuff, and I'm like, I cannot, I, I'm not even going to touch this because I can't even come close to whatever it is that they're doing, right? Well, we're thinking about data quality and census data or whatever data, how... I guess it would help if we think about this in like terms of audience. Let's just say like your average practicing data scientist, right? So they've gone through whatever boot camp or course or self-taught. They are like in the workplace doing their data science. What level of granularity should they be thinking about data quality? Like, is it down to every single individual value? Uh obvious well, it always depends but like i would start with every individual mm. data points right every row right okay. just you can like just there enough you'll have all you can have all sorts of questions like okay why is there a row here and why isn't there a row here <laughs> right like just those two questions alone is like a good week of work just like understanding that because you're like you start going into the tech stack right just like why is this row here what triggered this row right like is it a front-end operation? Did the browser make put the row there? Or is it the back-end operation, mm. right? Because there's a loss either way, right? Because if it's the browser, 15 million things can go wrong in the browser and therefore no row ever shows up. And you have to like mentally account for that. If it's the back-end, uh, different reasons can happen, right? Like where a row will or will not show up, right? Is there double counting? Why is there double counting? All sorts of things. I had a fun in. I, uh, one query I love running every so often is like I go to like a database that's supposed to have unique IDs and I just check if that's true. I've had a couple of CTOs swear at me when I show them that that is not true. <laughs> really fun. <laughs> Especially one was a revenue database. That was, that was like, a, it was the ad click database and there were like just a few duplicates in there. <laughs> and so he started cursing and ran back to this station to go talk to the uh, programming people. So that was fun. Um, yeah, those kinds of assumptions when they're not hard enforced, but they're just kind of like mm -hmm. supposed to be there can, can be really fun and to check on. Right. Um, so that, that's like, uh, that's, so that's like a basic integrity thing, like just with data. And then you can always go up a level or down a level to individual fields or to like, you know, why does this table exist in the way that it does? Right. But those are, mm -hmm questions you can wait on because you know they're they're like de implementation details at that point yeah I love that idea of starting with a row but I also really appreciate that you said that understanding one row of data is about a week's worth of work if you're lucky I, <laughs> I mean if you're if you're lucky right like it could be a really really long row right like you could have hundreds of thousands of fields but I think what that really gets to is this idea that data quality isn't like okay I've spent 20 minutes I've checked all the boxes <laughs> oh no <laughs> it's done it's great yeah because mm -hmm. that that could be weeks to months I mean depending on your data you might need it you might need to take the months to make sure it's in mm -hmm. the right format and you know ready to use yeah I mean imagine yeah. just one row of medical study data that one row is like months of work for multiple people in the medical field like a doctor or something a nurse blah 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 blah, blah had to like check on that row who knows the number of times and there's procedures the mm -hmm. procedures are terrifyingly long and just just understanding that, right? And you, you know, you have a thousand rows of these things, which is a very expensive study already. Just that alone can be, you know, your half your PhD, right? So, yeah, yeah. So those PhD projects, they're out there. They're just waiting for people. <laughs> All of this data. <laughs> yeah, they're just questions everywhere, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's part of what makes data science such an appealing field is if you are even the like you don't have to be curious about everything all the time, but if you are even just a little bit curious about stuff and good at not even good, but like like asking questions, there is an endless source of material available. Yeah, it's um, it's it's really good for people like me who love playing with domain knowledge. Right, I love domains. Right, I love to like. like someone's got a weird, obscure domain that they're expert on and they just know stuff about and they're like making data about it. Like I listened to them for hours about just how they're doing whatever it is that they're doing, right? And so each, like, you know, each row of data is the reflection, it's the shadow of a domain. Mm -hmm. And the more you understand it, the more you understand what's going on, right? Yeah, so this is the most brilliant segue that you have set up here with all of these obscure bits of domain knowledge. So you have a ton of hobbies, right? And you have, I think they've come and gone over the years, but um, I think one thing that that you and I have in common is that you don't just like have a hobby, you go all in yeah. on your hobbies. <laughs> yes. So to, you you really develop a sense of mastery on a hobby, right? And so so tell me about like, what are some of your your current domain explorations in terms of hobbies uh probably the, the most fun is like the gem cutting Look thing. At that. i am holding yeah. um this is a piece of synthetic ruby that you can buy this is like maybe 50 bucks of ruby. it is like a thousand uh i forget how heavy this is like maybe a couple of grams or something like a thousand carats or something like that you can cut this into so synthetic ruby is really cheap it's like the cheapest synthetic material okay. you can buy but it's really shiny. It's fun. And it's just like, you know, you buy a bag of these for like, whatever, a hundred bucks or something. And then you can turn them into like interesting gems that are, uh, here's one that I can just grab off the shelf, even though this was not one of my first ones I made, but like, so it's not that great. Oh and it's just like this shiny sparkly thing and it's not focusing very well. Right. And so you can cut this into a gem and then like if I and then it's like well now what do I do now that I have a bunch of these like shiny objects in my in my in my on my desk I like my daughter like picks them up she's like gonna get spoiled because she's gonna be surrounded by just gemstones right and then I was like well now well I have these so now I need to do something with them therefore I'm like on the side I'm like I need to go learn how to work with silver so that I can make mounting so that I can make something useful with these things otherwise I'm just I have paperweights <laughs> so these things snowball. I always find excuses to like find a second hobby off of another hobby and justify it somehow. <laughs> and it just keeps going. This is so what what got you interested in gem cutting? That seems I I I'm genuinely curious. Like, were you just one day like, I shall cut gems? Or was there a, a process? There, well, what happens? I don't know how, but somehow I fell into a rabbit hole on YouTube where I found a gem cutter thing maybe I was curious about it or something at some point right and it's just like so I was like maybe I woke up one day I'm like how does this done like just how is it done I'm just <laughs> I was just curious and I'm like oh well yeah. there's a device that you glue this is like a you glue it a, a stone onto a brass stop right okay. and then you just hold you have a device that holds it against a diamond plate that spins and you just kind of and you oh. just it holds at a fixed angle and you can rotate it at fixed angles and that's how you cut facets and it was like, and I'm like staring at this, watching it for a couple of months or something, you know, you know how YouTube works. And then eventually yeah. I'm like, this doesn't look very hard. How, what, what, can I do this myself? Like, and I look into that. I'm like, oh, a machine's not that expensive. Like a good machine's like only, well, I shouldn't say only, it is a few thousand dollars, but I'm like, well, it's a pandemic okay. and I have a little bit of disposable income. My wife will not be too angry at me if I do this because I'm only going to do this once. All right. And so it happened. And then I bought a machine, ordered it from Sri Lanka, it took a while to get here, months, buy some other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly here I am with gem cutting. <laughs> so. I mean, that's incredible. Like it's it's kind of like living out, you know, an MMO career kind of, right? Like you're jewel crafting. Um, yeah. So so is, is silver, what is it? Silver smithing? What is that called? Like, is yep, that up silver next? Smithing. So silver smithing, you can go online and look up. And it was like, well, there are jewelry classes all over the place, right? And I'm like, okay. okay. Then you look at the videos, I'm like, that is, does not seem extremely hard. Now it's not easy, but it's like, mm -hmm. well, metal, bits, fire. So I'm like, I, well, I can solder electronics. Soldering silver can't be all that much harder, right? 
spoiler it's slightly harder because there's like actual <laughs> tortures involved and things but it's still not that much harder and so that, all right i'll give this shot i'm very bad at it i haven't had time to practice <laughs> but it's like all right i'm gonna keep going i could also bought a 3d printer that i haven't figured out how to like i haven't set up no. yet so i can get castings done so i can i can do cad much better so I'm like, i can just cad up the complicated yeah. things that hold these gems and then get a cast which is probably a safer bet so yes <laughs> I mean, that's, that's amazing. And so how long did it take you to go? I feel like I followed a lot of this on Twitter. Um, it feels like you went from, I will learn how to cut gems. This is maybe has some challenges to it that I wasn't anticipating to, I mean, you're, I don't know what the levels are, but like, I would at least proficient, if not, you know, yeah, like, I'm like well on your way to mastery. I think it's like one gem cutting is surprisingly not that difficult because, you know, the machine, like, all the stuff is holding it for you. It's not like you were, there are people who are, you know, uh, at uh, where professional gem cutters are done, like, you know, the, the factory type got jobs. And they're usually in fairly like poor countries and they've got very low tech stuff. And it is just all muscle skill. They're just holding gems on these very basic things that don't have gears. They don't like the angles are set purely by muscle memory, essentially. And they just bang them out, right? So it's like, with all the mechanical aids, it's not that difficult to do it, right? It's just mm -hmm. mostly patience and practice. And, you know, a couple mm -hmm. hundred hours or so, you can probably get a decent looking gem. Like your first try, you can probably do it with someone helping you, right? So it's like, okay, well, now that I've done, become confident at this, and now I'm like, I want to do something else to like complement it and like just make it more complex because I'm apparently just insane. <laughs> It's just like leveling up. Um, uh -huh. You know, you've got a skill and, and you're leveling it up. Uh, do you, so one, how do you find the time? Like just uh, asking for me. Uh, I trade off time from other things. So like I have to rotate my hobbies, <laughs> for example, like, you know, okay. woodworking is totally out of question now because wood is just way too expensive. I don't have room for the, the mm -hmm. thing. Like I, if I build a table, I don't have room to put another table in my house, right? So forget it. <laughs> So that's been like shoved down the priority scale, but I have all the sharpening tools and all the whatever things, and I have that. And then I just try to like, well, I have this stuff already. What can I do with the next? How can I reuse it to do the next thing? <laughs> right. And then I keep, I, I just keep doing that. Um, so there's that. I also probably don't sleep nearly as much as I should be doing, but so there's also that. <laughs> so I don't know. It, somehow I can, I, I seem to be able to manage. I don't know how. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's true. It's not like you're spending eight hours a day, every day working on gem cutting type no. stuff. It, it's like yeah. a couple hours here or there, like a single gem will take me weeks because it's like an hour here, two hours there. You add it all up, right. it's like maybe a day of work. And if like, and that's because I'm not good at it. Like a professional who is, does this for a living would be able to bang one out in like, a couple of hours, right? So, you know, <laughs> so I'm making up for it with like my beginner skills with just time, but you know, I can afford that because it's a hobby. I'm not, I don't need to be fast. I just have to be good enough to satisfy my own, you know, whatever sense of goodness is. Yeah, I love that. I love, I love this idea. You've talked about practice and patience, which I think is key, but also um, not your hobby doesn't have to become your career, right? Like you don't need to go forth. I mean, you could eventually become a jewel maker. Uh, I'm not sure what the uh -huh. correct term is, but you, you could like, but that would take more time, but like, there is like a level that you have where you're looking for mastery. So do you ever have any crossover between like something in your hobbies that you've learned or thought about or experienced that crosses over with your work or vice versa? Uh, sometimes, uh, for example, uh, other universe of hobbies, I used to translate essentially for money professionally, right? Like I was a Japanese to English translator for like games. And so I worked also with a game dev company. So I like know that space a fair amount. And so it's like, well, so, you know, Translation, it's like working with other languages, especially working with Japanese because they don't speak English very well. I use mm -hmm. that just sometimes professionally, just like, hey, I can read this. Hey, I can talk to them. One time I was as a UX researcher, I flew to Japan for the Google Next conference because like they wanted to do research 
And I'm like, no one there will speak English. You have to speak Japanese to have any chance at communicating with these people. And so I just like went over there, I got permission and just started interviewing people at the conference for just what their experiences were. Right. So that was really, really fun. I also got a trip out of Japan out of it. So that was great. <laughs> So that was, an, that, that was an example of just me bringing stuff over, but it's also like, hey, working in game development, I also like, you know, project manager becomes part of it. Shipping, I am like, I've probably written a couple of blog posts about shipping and logistics because I yeah. watched people do that, right? Like to make goods, make boxed games is this terrifying process with artists, like vendors, people assembling the boxes, then shipping it out and all the horrors involved in shipping, right? And so all that has like, I just like find use for it because like that knowledge will be yeah. useful for some other place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you have a shipping conundrum with your hundred data, counting, counting oh, yeah, as hard the, stickers. The counting they... as hard data stickers that I have. <laughs> I have yeah. these and then it's like, they're sitting in a bag on my desk because I'm like, I want to ship them out. And I'm like, it costs too much money to ship them out for a profit. So I'm just gonna need an excuse yeah. to just give them away. <laughs> just give away stickers for everyone. Yeah, yeah, Ship it, shipping is hard. It is surprising. So in my adventures into animation, um, did you know that it takes like almost a year to produce a 22 minute episode of a cartoon like Bob's Burgers? Oh, wow, a year. A year. I was like, I don't know, eight weeks tops. Like that's got to be <laughs> so easy. It is close to a year um, wow. with you know all what? of the hands that go into that. Yeah. That's kind of crazy. There's this amazing anime, <laughs> anime Shiro Bako. Have you heard of that okay. one? Right. It's, I haven't. No. Uh, it's a couple years old now. It's, um, but I have friends in the anime industry because of the game industry. And all of us, we watch it and we remark on just how realistic it is. I'll link you to it later. But it, it is yeah, about yeah. an animation studio in Japan doing anime, right? And it's about, a, it follows the story of a project manager there. And she's got spreadsheets with all the, all the cuts, all the scene cuts, right? And she's like, well, this scene cut is from that animator. That one's from this animator. And she's like driving around getting the, the frames because it's on paper and getting them yeah. and then bringing them here. And then the, then the has to like bring it to the CG department, editing department, all that, all that jazz. And we're, and we're all just watching it. I'm like, this, it hurts to watch because we know exactly that this is how it is and how the sausage is made. And it's just terrifying, but it's also very fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm super stoked to, for that link. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much, you know, it's called, we call them X sheets or dope sheets with the timing. Um, I was listening to a podcast where this guy was like, you know, my job is basically to be like, you have this arm swing at 17 frames, but it's funnier at 12 frames. And like, just thinking about like the kind of knowledge you have to internalize. Uh, and I'll put one on the screen of what it looks like, but it, it's, it is kind of almost like a, a weird data visualization and to be able to look at that and be like, oh yeah, it's not funny at 17, but if you take out five frames at 24 frames a second, that's going to make it funny. And I just, okay. <laughs> it's like, okay. I don't know. How, like, I'm just amazed that someone knows that. I love that someone knows that. <laughs> it's just like all these obscure details and things that go into it. Um, I have a mentor and she works at Pixar. And so she sometimes gives us the inside scoop on like weird animation things she's had to do or like how she had to work on um, something and like how hard it was and like the tricks she had to do to get it to work. And I was like, oh, so you mean it's not like 360 degrees beautiful in an animation? And she was like, no, no. Oh yeah, I've seen those where they have to like, ups like ruin the proportions to get the shot right because it doesn't look realistic otherwise. Yeah, it was, so she was on the Trolls movie and one of them is like the two trolls have to give each other a hug, but uh -huh. their arms are actually like this oh, right. big. They just, so they have to stretch and <laughs> Yeah, she, so they had to like get the right angle and like the arms were like stretched all the way out, but it also has to look realistic. And I was like, that's really hard. Like that's really hard. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's amazing what, what goes into creating things and like not just creating things but then getting them to people right like there's the ideation the creation but then distribution and distribution is whew, oh yeah someone else oh yeah 
<laughs> not for me, but you do distribute something. You have a newsletter that you hmm. not, you are better than all of us in that you write regularly. Like what motivates you to keep writing? Uh, almost 95% of it is because I know that if I drop one, it's going to like the drop is going to continue. And it's one of, it's been a, it's been one of those, like, don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it kind of things. And I've, to my surprise, to my wife's surprise has, I've gone over like over two years without dropping a single one. <laughs> I mean, I can't, I don't, I'm sure other people keep to writing schedules as well. It is so, this is me projecting my own biases. It is so hard for me to like, tweet every day like I can't even imagine writing you you write weekly right yours is yes. weekly or is it twice a week it's okay every Tuesday I get a post out there's like the newer the newer like paid ones are like shorter and that's like every yeah. two weeks but if I okay. I though I don't hold myself to that one it's like if it slips that one's okay to slip but the every Tuesday one mm -hmm. has been going for over two years and my wife every time is like how do you have so much things to say and I'm like I don't know I'm desperately thinking of an idea like every Friday night. I'm like, I need a, I need a topic. And I'm like scanning Twitter or just like looking for inspiration, like either at work or whatever. Yeah. And I can somehow manage to find something. I mean, some weeks are always a little weaker than other weeks, but like I managed to do it and I don't know how. I have no idea how. That's, that's incredible. Although these days scanning Twitter, I feel like gives you lots of material. It's um, lots of it. I'm like, do I really want to talk about the dumpster fire again, like everyone else, right? So there's been a very deliberate, like, I'm not going to talk about the mm -hmm. thing everyone's already talking about. And so I'm like looking the other yeah. way, but that's like a very deliberate choice. Well, you did a great post on data friend connections and Twitter. Uh -huh. And you had some great advice in there. So we know each other through Twitter. Yeah. Um, we are both part of like data Twitter and where do we go now? Like where, <laughs> where are we going to hang out and talk about data? Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? Like data Twitter has been this constant in many of our lives, right? Like I literally owe one of my jobs to data Twitter. I got laid off somewhere for whatever yeah. reason. And then just someone from data Twitter is like, Hey, you should interview at this place they're hiring. And I got a job there. It's like, I just, that was magic, right? And that has been true for other yeah. places. I mean, I've given all sorts of resume advice and all sorts of things, right? And job posting to fly around that place. And so I don't want to see it go. And so I've mm -hmm. been kind of like banging on the pots and pans saying like, hey guys, if this thing goes on fire, which it seems to be doing right now, here's some backups just in case, right? Like I, you can call me crazy if it doesn't burn down and we're all fine like next year. But just in case, here's some backups. And I've been just sharing Google Sheets of it because mm -hmm. we're data people. Obviously, it's going to be in a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> and luckily, like we've been moved to Macedon, or a lot of us have, as a backup. Uh, and there's Discords and Slacks. So we will probably be fine in the near term. But I don't know about the medium yeah. term. Um, but yeah, I think that's great advice. You've, you have put out great resources about just staying connected. And I think you made this great point about you may not be able to connect to everybody that you're connected to now, but if you connect to like a critical number, you will find, you will find everybody and find new people. Yep. Yeah. It's basic yeah. network theory, right? You just need to get to one or two of the hubs. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm dragging up like weird things in my past like studies again, but it's like, this is perfect. I love it. There, there's like some hubs right like you know if you connect to like for example vicky boykis or you know chris albin or something right they will they through their shit posting will bring you to the rest of the community right so you don't have to grab everyone but you you do need to connect to some of them or else it is extremely hard yeah. if it totally all disappears on you and you're just lost right so having just a little bit is a good backup yeah i love that so where on the web is a good place to find you? Uh, da, 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 my... You can list as many as you would like, <clears throat> or just one. <laughs> uh, my my newsletter is probably the big easiest one, counting at counting.substack.com, right? So okay. obviously the whole counting theme, I'm just like went with it at some point. So that that's one. Otherwise, uh, da, 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 uh, randyow.com is like where I post my links to myself. 
Uh, okay. And that's really it. I mean, my Mastodon thing, it's so awkward to say, right? All the Mastodon domains are just disgustingly awkward to say, right? So mm -hmm. I'll like link to Mastodon is a weird word, right? It's a mast like it's a cool animal. It's yeah. a very cool animal. All in on the Mastodon. It is weird to say. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's not a it doesn't roll off the tongue, right? So mm -hmm. mm. no. And also like just the domain names and all that. It's like there's no way I can pronounce this thing in a way that someone will type it into a keyboard and have it go to the right place. So it's like I'll link you to yeah. it and then we'll deal with it later. <laughs> Thank you.